Thanks for staying up later. John Lovitz is with us. We'll talk about some of his film work in a bit, but the logical place to begin is with Saturday Night Live. Was The Liar the <coughs> biggest one for you? I mean, Master Thespian was big yeah. and the annoying no, liar. man and everything. Yeah, The Liar was, uh, yeah. It started off as a joke between a friend of mine and I, just an inside joke, and I was trying to pick up on her. She goes, well, I like a guy with a fat wallet. And I said, oh, well, uh, my dad just had 15 oil wells come in. And I said, well, I am a pathological liar, you know. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll write this up for the Groundlings. And so I made it, you know, Pathological Liars Anonymous, which would be like Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's not funny, but I thought a guy, you know, saying that he's a pathological liar right. and, and then just starts, and starts telling a story and just starts lying about it. And the next thing you know, everybody's doing it. And I really didn't have any clue to how big it was. Everybody would keep telling me. They go, oh, everyone's imitating. And I go, they are? Because you're just, when you're on that show, you're working... You're basically you're in your apartment, you know, and you, you go to sleep, you wake up, you go to work, and you're there all day, you eat, and I mean all day for like 12, 14 hours, 16 hours, then you go home and sleep, and that's, you're just in there six days a week, and mm -hmm. on Sunday you just crash all day. And, uh, and then I went to, uh, they had the first comic relief, and they asked me, Whoopi Goldberg actually, she got me in it, which was nice, and um, I did it on that, and, and I started doing it, and everybody's laughing, and I go, man, it's all the way out here. You know, and you have no concept, uh, if you've never been on television, how it, really how it just goes everywhere. And you then know. it showed up, uh, Doonesbury <coughs> made yeah, reference Doonesbury to it, whole Johnny Carson it. mentioned it, right? Yeah, Johnny Carson and the foot, yeah, and it just, it's people still bring it up once in a while, and I, I've seen it, I just saw it in a rap song, I mean, it's still, yeah, that's the ticket. I didn't make that up, it's from old movies, but it's, it, I got it back out there and it's still being done. And yeah, it, it was, it was amazing, you know, it's like, you know, it started off, just imagine like if you have an inside joke between just you and your friend, like your best friend. It's just a little dumb thing you do, mm -hmm. and you get a chance to do it on television. Next thing you know, the whole country is imitating it. And that's, that's what it was to me. And it was, um, I remember I, the first time I did it in the Groundlings, uh, we'd have like a panel of six people, and in the audience, you'd go down and say your name and what you did. And i said, oh, I'm Tommy Flanagan of Pathological Liars Anonymous. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm the president of that organization. And then the audience would ask questions. And I didn't realize what I had at first. And at some point, I, I, they go, what, do you do this? I, they go, are you always been a liar? I go, no, no, I'm not a liar. And then they said, you know, you could, they could ask you anything in the way, and you could say anything, and it would be funny. Practically, they go, like, what's your favorite sport? And you just go, uh, 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 uh bowling. You know, and, and, you know, <laughs> and bowling's not funny. It's, you know, it's just set up. And it just hit, and that was, that's always the hardest thing to find is an idea that's, you know, uh, I'm not saying it's great, but, you know, finding a simple idea, but that really works, that so you can just almost do anything. You remember uh, Satisfaction? I wrote it. <laughs> you did not write Satisfaction. Well, uh, not all of it. Actually, uh, uh, Mick Jagger wrote it. Yeah, that's it, but, uh, but it was originally called, uh, I can't get no uh, service in this place. <laughs> I changed it. You know Mick Jagger? Oh, yeah. We were in Vietnam together. I guess Master Thespian was probably the second best known guy, right? I think so. The, this awful actor. That was actor. my favorite character, yeah. Was he? <laughs> yeah, because it was me. Uh, really, all my characters were, it was just me. What I do, basically, is just see old movies or just think, oh, I wish I could play that. Or, or it's just me goofing off with my friends and then thinking, oh, I'll write that up. And that's, that's where I get my ideas. And... That was a, like a conglomeration of like John Barrymore and John Carradine and, a, and an acting teacher of mine, uh, William Needles. And he was in the Stratford Festival in Canada and he taught at my college and taught me Shakespeare. And he'd, he'd say, you know, I'd never heard anyone do Shakespeare like this before. And he'd say, oh, for the muse of fire that would ascend, <laughs> the brightest heaven of invention, you know. And I thought it was hysterical. And it was good, but it was like so big, you know, and flamboyant. Yeah. And, and so I just tried to make the guy, like, he just, he, all my characters, really, they're like basically, you know, <laughs> likable jerks. You know, they're jerks, but you like them anyway. Because the liar, you know, this guy just lies about everything, but somehow you like him. Right. And the master thespian is like, you know, he's, he's that's not his name. He just says that he's the greatest, the master actor, you know. And he, and he you know, I was the subtext in Gone with the Wind, you know. And I was, and he, and he's just an idiot. And he's a horrible actor. <laughs> <laughs> but he thinks he's great, you know. And then when people insult him, he gets his feelings hurt. You know, it's funny to me. It's and, and even when he messes up, at least outwardly, that view of himself is not punctured. He can't remember, no. so... Line? Line? <laughs> yes, it's like, you know, to be... 
Ein! <laughs> or not to be. I know. Or not to be. Ein! You know, it's like that, you know. And he's incredibly loud. Stand-up guy. In fact, I don't even think you would define yourself as a comedian. You're an actor who can right. do funny things with characters or with funny <coughs> material within a script. You're a comic actor. Yeah, I would say that, and straight acting. Most of my training was that, and uh, I'd wanted to be a, a stand-up. And like when I was uh, 13, uh, I saw Take the Money and Run with Woody Allen. Mm -hmm. And before that, I wanted to be a baseball player, and Willie Mays was it. And then I started getting into Woody Allen, and I wasn't good enough in baseball. So I just said, this is what I, I started getting more interested in it. And the movie uh, Lenny came out, Dustin Hoffman. And I, I thought the movie was great, and I'd never heard of him. So I went to the record store and looked under comedy to buy Lenny Bruce's albums. And I also saw Woody Allen's albums. So I bought those, and I would memorize it. And I would do it in my college dorm. They have like this, it's called Prado. Uh, I went to UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. and, the Anteaters of UC yeah, Irvine. Yeah, the Anteaters, yeah. And uh, I know most people think I'm from New York, but I'm from the Valley, you know, Encino and Tarzana. So I went to UC Irvine. And they would have like a Prado, night, you know, where you'd perform. So I would do that. And um, after college, I went to the comedy store, and they would have this potluck uh, night where you, on Mondays where you'd get up and improvise, mm -hmm. and anyone could go. And then my third night, week going, I was waiting in line, and then they, and then they said, uh, oh, uh, we're asking certain people not to come back, and you're one of them. And my just, you know, my heart just sank. Because I thought, well, I'm not that good, but I'm, you know, the other people coming aren't that uh, any better. And I, but I was just pretty devastated. And then they had like a, a workshop, a comedy workshop, and this stand-ups would teach it. And the stand-up would said, well, I'm in stand-up. They're not hiring stand-ups. You know, they, you think they would, but they, they want actors. So I just said, well, I'm going to skip stand-up and just go for a, acting. I mean, I really looked at it as, as a step to way to get into acting, which it is now, much more. Then it wasn't as, as much. Wasn't there uh, a guy who was a friend of your father, somehow connected to the entertainment industry who said son if there's anything else you yeah. can do do it yeah boy <laughs> yeah how'd you find research i say you always say you guys research. do your research that's like yeah yeah i was this guy uh well my that was a uh, doctor in the valley and he this guy ed gradinger he's like charge of business affairs at 20th century fox and i had this tape i took this acting workshop with this guy tony barr and we had a, a scene night, a, and, and people came, and I had two scenes, so I, my dad said, well, I know somebody if you want to give him your tape, so I did, and he, yeah, he wrote this letter saying, you know, because of my relationship with your father, I've had this tape looked at fairly, if you can do anything else, do it. Mm -hmm. It's a long, hard road. Good luck. <laughs> you know? And then I also gave the tape, though, to, to uh, another patient, is William Blinn, who wrote Brian's song and created Starsky and Hutch, and he said, well, I just did comedy, he said, well, you're, you're limiting yourself, but I think you have talent, go for it, so. So I showed, showed it to Tony Barr, my acting teacher. I said, well, which guy do I listen to? He goes, well, listen to the, don't listen to the lawyer. Listen to the creative guy, you know. And we're back with John Lovitz. Of all the movie work you've done so far, the one I like best, and I think the one most people like best, was really a relatively small part, maybe only 10, 12 minutes on screen, near the beginning of A League of Their Own, when you were Cappy Cappadino, the scout. Yeah, I, I love doing that. And uh, uh, Penny Marshall, she's, uh, we became good friends, and, so she, and she's put me in her movies, and I've lived at her house for a couple of summers, and she, she had Lowell Gans and the... Bob Lumandel wrote the movie that said, write a part for me, f for John. And, and so they wrote this, uh, they based it on a character I did a, on uh, Saturday Night Live, Eddie Spumoso, which is like a, a you know, a gangster. Mm -hmm. And it was imi uh, imitating, uh, you know, movie characters from the 40s. So they, those guys, they just wrote it so great. And it was so tailor-made to me and my delivery and what I do that it was just, you know, I could just do it. And it was... 
it was just fun because it's so well written, and the guy's it's he's so sarcastic and 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 mm -hmm. mean, but funny, you know, and and it's like I don't know, it's like it's like a likable jerk, really. The guys, but you like him anyway, and so. I, it was heaven for me because we're at Wrigley Field, and it was, I felt like I was making a movie in the 40s, which I, and I love those old movies. And then we're on, I also love baseball, so, you know, it was like a combination of everything, and it was just a, just a lot of fun. No, wait! Can't you just watch me pitch? Daddy, get your mitt. I'll, I'll throw him a few. I'll show you some pitches. No, 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 no. Now, look. I know the goods when I see the goods. And she's the goods. I'm sorry. Hmm. Hmm. Will you shut up? You're a pitcher, huh? Yeah. I'll tell you what. If she comes, you can come too. If you stink, it'll only cost us a train ticket. Get these wild animals away from me! Haven't you ever heard of a leash? Because I used to play in Little League and stuff, we were playing catch. You know, practicing, and I'd say, "Yeah, you're pretty good for a girl." And they go, "No, I'm pretty good." And I go, "All right, you're right." And, and it was interesting because you learned that you had these like prejudices that you didn't even know about. And and you think, well, of course, women can be good at baseball. I mean, they play tennis and golf and everything else. Why couldn't they be? And the the movie was a, it really kind of opened my mind a lot to, um, I guess, just you know, uh, prejudices that you have against. Uh, uh, women and then anyone else that you don't even think about. You just say, oh, you, and I was in the movie, they go, women can't play baseball, and I thought that myself. And then you'd see these girls, and they're, you know, they're really throwing the ball. And... Well, a good aspect of the film was at the end, uh, with the credits, they had the surviving women who actually had played uh, in this uh, short-lived league in, in right. the 40s, uh, some of whom still had good form, women in their 60s or early 70s. Right. And you could see, as you watch these elderly women uh, batting and running and throwing, that when they were in their 20s or 30s, they obviously could play pretty well. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, and, and uh, you know, we met some of them, and I, I just felt, after I saw the movie, I just felt really proud that I was in it. Your connection with Penny Marshall precedes this film, right? You'd worked on a couple others? Yeah, I was in Big and Jumbo Jack Flash and... Uh, I'd, I'd met her my first week uh, of Saturday Night Live, the week, before, uh, the week we did the show. And it's funny, that first show, Madonna was also hosting, and I worked with her. So, uh, and then Penny, was just, she just befriended me and, and you know, helped me a lot. And I remember after my first show, she called me up, she goes, learn your lines. I go, why? She goes, you're reading the cards, you know, I can tell. And yeah. It helped, and then she just would put me in her movies. And uh, yeah, she's been great to me. What did they want you to do in Home Alone? I read where you had mm. uh, a chance to be in the movie, turned it down. Yeah, well, I was an idiot, you know. Uh, I, 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 that's where your ego gets in the way, because, you know, I had been on the show five years, and they send a script, and they go, they really want to meet with you, and, and you read it, and they say, well, the script's funny, and I go, it was funny, and I go, but it's the kid's movie, you know. I said, I don't want to play second fiddle some kid, you know. <laughs> Next thing you know, it's the biggest comedy of all time, I'm like, well, I guess I could have played second fiddle. It wouldn't have been so bad, but... Did, did they want you in the, what turned well, out to be know. Joe they Pesci's role? No, I think it would have been Daniel Stern's part. Oh, really? But they didn't offer it to me, but they really wanted to meet, and they kept calling, we really want to meet with you. And, 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 uh, but the, the, the truth is that I read it, and I, I just felt I couldn't play the part well, because you have to, like, re it's like a lot of reacting and kind of being big in a certain way. And, and not mugging, but it's a certain style that I, I frankly, I, I'm not good at that. And uh, I don't think so. I, I couldn't have done it, and he did a great job. But even I found it even worse than that. There was another actor who was set to do Daniel Stern's part, like the day before, a few days before, they yanked him and put in Daniel Stern. Who was it? So if you, I don't know, but I feel bad for the guy because you think I'm kicking myself. He must be like, you know, what actually himself. what actually worked. I mean, Daniel did a very good job, but what also helped was the difference in physical types. Joe is short and rounder, right, yeah. and, and Daniel is very tall and lanky, yeah. and you and, and Joe would have been roughly similar physically, you know, or at least closer physically, and it might not have been as funny visually. Yeah, you know, and so I wasn't offered it, but they wanted to meet, and then the second one happened, and, and the director goes, no, he wouldn't meet with me on the first one. I, I was surprised he remembered it. He goes, no, he didn't meet me the first time, why should I meet with him now, you know? Chris Columbus, eat your heart out, so funny. <laughs> So, so I guess I'll just work with Rob Reiner now instead of him, and that's the way that goes. What about uh, the film that's released now, uh, just recently, oh, with Emilio Estevez? Yeah, I just, that was fun. I only worked about five days, and I kind of do the, a spoof, it's a spoof of uh, Lethal Weapon. 
And the ironic thing is, is that loaded a uh, lethal weapon, uh, Joel Silver produced it, and and uh, he, and I think Larry Gordon too, uh, Richard Donner and him. But they, he brought me in, and the part was written for me. But then they decided to use Joe, and he made his own. So now I'm doing a spoof of a part that was written for me, and it's, it's like Hot Shots and, and Naked mm -hmm. Gun. It's it's very it's funny. All right, but listen, you gotta understand something. This thing is big. I mean, it's really big. It's bigger than Watergate. It's bigger than Oprah. I mean, it's big, and there's nothing you can do because they're too strong and they're too powerful, and it's the too. Th Je ne sais quoi. We can protect you. La comédie est finie. Guess that's the last time he'll trust a cop. Give it to me straight. Is this a big checkout? Come on, level with me. How bad is it? It's not bad. You'll be fine. Be back on your feet in no time. <laughs> Three. Hello, I'm Army Archer, and you can just feel the electricity in the air, because tonight, in the tradition of such classics as Marty, Requiem for a Heavyweight, and The Petrified Forest, we are celebrating a return to the golden age of television with the production of an original play to be televised live from this historic stage, starring John Lovitz. It's interesting how you first hooked up with Reiner, because it comes off a show you were doing a couple of years ago, right? right? Maybe just a year or so ago. Yeah, actually, yeah, in May, uh, May of last year, and uh, yeah, Alan's wife Bell and I, we we'd met, and actually we met at Penny Marshall's house before, and talked about doing a TV show together. So we decided, we came up with a format. I, I wanted to do something where I, I was, uh, you know, could be myself, funny as myself, funnier than now, and also, <laughs> and also do characters. So, uh, and it was kind of conglomeration of kind of like what Jack Benny did and, and like, and Alan said, what about Playhouse 30? So we kind of mixed the two. And, and we did it live and it was, I had a great time and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Alan and I, you know, we, did, we just really, it was really 50-50. We wrote it and produced it together. And it was, it was a great experience. And so really because of that, they wrote this part for me in North and he really, it's because of him really that I'm going to be doing this movie. In your special, there was a bit where Reiner had a phone. If he saw anything he liked, he could, he could pick up the phone. Is it, you know, everyone on Saturday Night Live, when you get the show, even in your first year, they go, so when are you going to do movies? And you're, using, and you're saying, well, let me just do the show first. But after a while, you start thinking, yeah, I'd, it's, I, I want to do movies. And, and most people that do TV series nowadays are doing it to get in the movies. So I said, well, then let's just admit it. You know, who are we kidding? So I, I was on stage, and I said, well, if uh, I had, like, you know, we have some filmmakers in our audience today, Rob Reiner, Ron Underwood, and Jerry Bruckheimer, and... Uh, and uh, if we've put a phone in front of them, so if you see anything on in the, tonight's play that you enjoy, you can pick up the phone in front of you, and it'll ring this phone up here on stage, and you can offer me a job in your next film. You know, <laughs> bad news, and it's serious too. What could it be? Oh, what could it be? Curiously enough, all three of them did offer me jobs in their, in their films later on. Good ploy. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun, and the, show, it was a, and the best part, we, we, Alan came up with a joke, it was like a parody of The Godfather, and James Caan found out about it, because uh, he did a movie for Castle Rock, which is a company that did it Andy Scheinman, and, and, and he got Robert Duvall to come. So I, I, that blew me away, because they're in my special, you know, my show, and then they and uh, Alex Rocco does a thing where he's more green and he gets, you know, mm -hmm. dice going in his right. eye and he, like, dies. And then it, they cut to the audience and Alex and James Conn and Robert Duvall are, like, you know, high-fiving. You know, and I, and I, you know, The Godfather's, like, you know, probably the great, one of the greatest movies ever made. And here these two guys are in my show. And that, to me, was my favorite part of the show. <laughs> Way beyond anything I did. I was just, it was so thrilling to me. And then it was so nice of them to do that, you know. And I, I didn't know them. And... I met James Conley once before, but it was just a, I wish the show would have gone on, but, any, but we did, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Loan, yes. All that remains here is a simple good night, but how would the master thespian
close the show and say, see you later. And so, adieu. <laughs> later. <laughs>